want to thank everybody for coming. And um, uh, we're the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. And we're very happy to have you here. And um, I'd like to introduce Professor Daron Benatar, who is a history professor at Fordham University. Tonight, the title of his talk is Kosherizing the New Anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. Jewish Anti-Zionism. Professor Benatar is a historian of the early American Republic and a published playwright. He has produced such plays as Autobiography, The Worst Man, Peace Warriors, and Behave Yourself Quietly. Professor Benatar is currently studying the performance of masculinity in men's divorce narratives during the early Republic. He also most recently authored, together with Richard Brown, Taming Lust, Crimes Against Nature in the Early Republic. Please join me in welcoming Professor Daron Benatar. Um, thank you. Um, do I need to go with this? It helps. It helps. Yes. Um, so, I'm, I usually don't read my lectures. Um, and, uh, but this uh, time, I'll ask your forgiveness in allowing me to read the lecture because um, I'm trying to uh, argue something that is um, nuanced and um, my kind of off-the-cuff remarks could um, somehow undermine the complexity. So um, I ask you forgiveness and I, every so often I'll look at you to make sure you're not falling asleep. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the poem on, uh, on the left by Tom Paulins called Killed in Crossfire um, sets the gold standard for modern anti-Semitism. In a few vicious lines, uh, Pauline weaves old themes of blood libel, Jewish clannishness, and Zionist SS. But before unleashing the hateful words, Pauline took cover in the words of a Jew. Atop the poem, Pauline inserted a quote on the slide here from written by Victor Klemperer in his diary for June 13, 1934. Now, the use of Klemperer was, of course, strategic. His long diaries became a strange bestseller in Germany in the 1990s, in a phenomenon that few could uh, fathom and none could explain. The boring and pedantic Klemperer became the Anne Frank of post-unification Germany the perfect Jewish victim who was not even much of a Jew. Um, Klemperer converted to Protestantism and even uh, and voiced dislike for Jews even uh, to the family, his own family was murdered by the Nazis. But he was a good Jew, a credit to the race. And now Pauline could publish his hate freely. After all, what he said was no different from what Victor Klemperer noted in 1934. Even the Jews admitted, the Zionists are Nazis. Klemperer, of course, could not be blamed for providing cover for Pauline. The entry was from 1934, and however offensive one might find the comment, it certainly did not rise to Pauline's level of bigotry. Klemperer wrote it, after all, when Nazism seemed like just another pogrom, not the mad attempt to kill every Jewish woman, man, and child. But in taking cover under Klemperer, Pauline has followed common practice in contemporary anti-Semitic discourse. Having a Jew denounce Israel as a Nazi state has become quite common. Pink Floyd's Roger Waters declared that the parallels between Israel-Palestine situ Israel situation and what went on in the 30s in Germany are crushingly obvious. Daniel Boyarin, who is the, uh, probably the leading scholar of Talmud in America at the time, and our, at the time, right now he's alive, um, wrote that just as Krichandi died in Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Sebibor, he feared his Judaism is dying in Nablus, Dehesha, and Betin, which is Betel, and Khalil, which is Hebron. Former Israeli uh, IDF, IDF paratrooper, Yonatan Shapira, uh, sprayed the Hebrew graffiti, liberate all ghettos, Yishachu Kol uh, followed by Free Gaza, on the, in English, on the remaining ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto Wall. The controversy over contemporary anti-Semitism centers on Israel, which is often a stand-in for the Jews as a whole in attracting animosity. 
We live in an age, uh, writes David Nuremberg in his masterful new study of anti-Semitism, quote, in which millions of people are exposed daily to some variant of the argument that the challenges of the world they live in are best explained in terms of Israel. Anti-Zionists angrily reject the charge. They complain that anti-Semitism is directed against uh, Jews, not against the colonial state of Israel, where they are critics and or enemies of a particular political entity. They have nothing against Jews per se. On the contrary, many of them are Jews themselves. And they charge the equation between Israel and Jews is fallacious and aimed at discrediting legitimate criticism of Israel and also at stifling free speech. Philosopher Judith Butler, for example, started to write Parting Ways, a quote, to debunk the claim that any and all criticism of the state of Israel is effectively anti-Semitic. An Oxford historian, Avi Schlein, in a passage evoking the worst charge of all against Jews, deicide, declared that Israel's apology is, quote, not content with the, thirst, with the 30 pieces of silver, insist on retaining the crown of thorns. That's, of course, a patently false charge. Opposition to Israeli policies is not anti-Semitic. No one in his or her right mind has ever argued that, and it is Butler, Schlein, and their allies who know that. Their project is not criticism of Israel, but bring about the end of the state of Israel. The effort to make radical distinctions between hostility to Jews and Israel is terribly disingenuous. You cannot wish harm on more than half of the world's Jewry and claim it's not anti-Semitic. Israel, however flawed, and very flawed that it is, um, represents Jewish identity and collectivity in the world. The intense focus on the wrongdoings of one country, the Jewish state, cannot be understood as wholly separate from 2,000 years of anti-Judaism. Indeed, Monica schwartz Feisel's study of uh, decades uh, of hate mail sent to the Jewish consulate in Berlin, uh, and it, uh, in, sorry, in Bonn and Berlin, concluded that, quote, it's impossible, and that's a, uh, that's a most recent study, it's impossible to distinguish between anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism. Modern anti-Semites have turned the Jewish problem into the Israel problem. They have redirected the final solution from the Jews to the state of Israel, which they see as the embodiment of evil." End of quote. The findings, of course, are not surprising. Opposing Israel's existence does not only deny the right of Jews to self-determination, it denies their right to life. The list of progressive anti-Israel Jews is long and growing featuring university professors, journalists, human rights activists, and agitators. It's fashionable. The seeming righteousness of their apostasy can turn obscure academics into intellectual celebrities. Getting a Jew to support anti-Jewish measures protects against the charge of anti-Semitism. The resort to the Jewish alibi is quite common. Boycott, divest, sanction Israel uh, of in, uh, uh, England, BDS from now on in this lecture, denied it could be anti-Semitic, pointing out that many Jewish organizations and prominent Jew Jewish academics and cultural figures support the cause. Um, John Judas um, recently prefaced his salvo about the all-too-powerful Jewish lobby who forced President Truman to make a terrible mistake and support the partition of 1947 with, I'm Jewish, so you can't call me anti-Semitic. And even the New York Times, which has been very critical of Israel in for years, has taken to deploying this strategy. Reporting on the strong public reaction to the decision of the American Studies Association to boycott Israeli academic institutions, journalist Tamar Lewin, seeking to dispel the notion that the boycott had anything to do with anti-Semitism, pointed out that support of the boycott include some prominent Jewish professors. So if some Jews will define Israel, then it must be all right. But identity is not enough. Jewish kosherizers feel their in invectives with quotes and references from Jewish texts to delegitimize Zionism and Israel. Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, publishes a regular commentary blog called entitled the Palestinian Talmud, which incorporates biblical stories and Talmudic quotes into an all-out demonization of Israel. Critics generally discount such claims to a place uh, in the Jewish tradition and conversation. Professor Robert Wistrich, the preeminent historian of anti-Semitism in the world, uh, wrote dismissively that the Jewishness of most of those who like to see themselves as heroic dissidents uh, and who demonize Israel and Zionism, the name of Judaism, is so skin deep, deep that it scarcely extends beyond their willingness to denigrate Israel. 
I don't share this view. To be sure, some professions of concern for what Israel does to the Jewish religion, such as the, by the notoriously secular uh, uh, Avi Shleim and Ilan Pepe, are too phony to be taken seriously. But there are many in the emerging anti-Zionist community for whom Jewish identity and practice are central features of their identity, central and also cherished. They are learned, smart, decent, and claim a personal intimate connection with their Jewish ancestry. They are carving a new and most challenging place in the geography of both Judaism and anti-Judaism. Defined by the tropes of personal narrative of disillusionment and fetishized Judaism and Jewish values, they kosherize a seismic shift in contemporary discourse about Judaism, Jews, and Israel. Let me say that in the uh, uh, longer version of the paper, which is it's a, it's a long paper, I now talk about the narrative of disillusionment, um, and I focus on Avram Borg, but I'm not. I'm skipping this completely in this because we don't. I don't have time. Um, I have students here, and they are already suffered too much. Uh, <laughs> Anti-Semitism is dialectical. It emerges between and among Jews and non-Jews. It is tied to the Jewish condition of being simultaneously part of the world and apart from it. Apostasy plays an important role in this relationship. In each generation, Jews opt out of their communities for full participation in surrounding cultures. These converts sometimes turn on their co-religionists with great passion. For anti-Semites, the apostate becomes a crucial informer. The former insider who, can, who had seen the light and takes on the mission of exposing the alleged vileness of Jews uh, to the unsuspecting world. Sometimes apostates officially sever their ties to, the Jewish, to Jews and Judaism, and at other times they take on the mantle um, of the right kind of Jew, the credit to the race. Their anti-Jewish campaigns and denunciations give credibility, authenticity, and legitimacy to anti-Judaism. But one must tread very carefully when discussing Jewish apostasy as to not to delegitimize Jewish dissent. Contemporary dissenters come out of a powerful Jewish tradition of self-criticism that goes all the way back to the founding experiences and texts of Judaism. The Hebrew Bible stands as the single most critical indictment of Jews as individuals and as nations. Prophets and dissenters denounce uh, the moral and religious failings of Israel uh, and prescribe expulsion and death. Rabbinic Judaism is also all about dissent and disputation. Controversial outcasts in one generation are recast as moral and just authorities generations later. The Jews of Paris, the most extreme example, burned the works of Maimonides, the most respected Jewish philosopher and theologian of all times. Indeed, one could easily construct two millennia of Rabbinic Judaism as a series of dialogues of, with apostasy, from Hillel to Mordechai Kaplan from Rabbi Akiva to Adin Steinsaltz. Intellectual disputation and social criticism are very different from joining forces with anti-Semites. Yet the analysis of Jewish kosher risers needs to be tempered by honoring the Jewish tradition of dissent and social criticism, and by acknowledging the inglorious history of the way in which some Jewish communities um, have dealt too harshly and unfairly with dissenters. The, the Talmud uh, struggles to make sense of the excommunication of two great sages, Rabbi Eliezer and Akav Yaben Ma'alalel, who refused to go along with the majority of opinion. The Jewish community of Amsterdam excommunicated uh, Baruch Spinoza in 1665 for expressing doubts about God and the exclusive relationship with Moses, opinions that most modern Jews, even observant ones, share. Emancipation, secularization, and the rise of Jewish nationalism altered the nature of Jewish identity and Jewish heresy and unleashed a new kind of overreaction to Jewish self-criticism. Who can forget the vilification of America's greatest second post-World War II writer, Philip Roth, for his portrayal of some Jewish characters in his fiction? The well-meaning women and men who kosherize modern anti-Semitism are not the medieval converts who turned on their families and friends. It is vital to assert here and everywhere that some Israeli policies are controversial and merit scrutiny. Radical criticism of kosherized anti-Semitism only when it endorses the destruction of Israel, when it employs old anti-Semitic tropes to describe Israel's relationship with the world, and it, when it conflates Zionism with Nazism. Scholarly analysis of the phenomena must be moderated by the recognition that offensive rhetorical excesses and efforts to silence critics 
have not been the exclusive domain of the radical left. Far from it. Nazi's demagogues quickly resort to the Jewish N-word, which is Nazi, of course, to describe critics of Israel. And at least one mass emailer sometimes referred to Barack Obama as the Fuhrer. Some campus Hillel refuse to show Academy Award film nominees, like five broken cameras, because they feel they narrates a partisan Palestinian perspective on the separation wall. Radical elements in the Jewish community have uh, created blacklists of Israel critics, an unacceptable effort to support the present dissent, and lest we forget. Such extremism does not remain in cyberspace. Intolerant bigots have physically assaulted so-called Jewish traitors. And the picture on this slide must always remain in our mind. This is a picture of Yigal Amir, the Jewish extremist who assassinated Yitzhak Rabin. So this should be always a reminder whenever we address this issue not to cross the boundary. Only a few of the Jewish kosherizers qualify as anti-Semites themselves. And those characters are too bizarre and off the wall to merit any serious consideration. I'm referring to people like Gilad Atzmon, Roger Waters, uh, Max Blumenthal, I mean, idiots. Uh, Mark Ellis, I mean, people who are not particularly uh, uh, learned or interesting. Their fanatic bigotry merits condemnation, not respectful analytical engagement. My argument is with the learned women and men who consider themselves proud descendants of Jewish dissenters, who stood up to power and sided with the weakest of members of society, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, or as we say in Hebrew, the Geria Tom Valmana. They don't want anything more than for Jew and Arab to live together in peace and harmony in peaceful Palestine, which will come to pass as soon as the military apparatus of the settler colonial state of Israel um, is starved of its Zionist, is starved and its Zionist ideology defeated. They acknowledge that their denunciation of Israel, as Butler put it, quote, can excite those who would condemn not only Israel, but Jews more generally in the spirit of anti-Semitism. And they're gonna have many more quotes from these people who always, they all acknowledge that there's a danger here. But the evils of Israel, they believe, justify their most unethical dance with propagators of Jew hatred. They enrage us, but they are not anti-Semitic. They often trace their intellectual roots to Hannah Arendt, the preeminent cosmopolitan Jewish thinker who exposed the evils of Zionism in Eichmann in Jerusalem. Avram Borg dedicated defend, defeating Hitler to Arendt, who quote, who, he wrote a quote, who knew and understood before anyone else, and Judith Butler called Arendt a resource for post-Zionism. It does not matter that Arendt invented an Eichmann that did not exist that she was uh, cruelly insensitive to the sufferings of the survivors who testified in the trial, and that she defamed the Judenrat. Eichmann in Jerusalem embodies the primary ideological principles of modern kosherizing. The denial of Israel's claim to representing world Jewry, the minimization of anti-Semitism as a factor in the final solution, the claim that the Holocaust was a human, not a Jewish uh, catastrophe, the suggestion that organized Jewry actually sided with the final solution, and the characterization of the Israeli justice system as a crude arm of the political establishment. And they certainly love her answer, her derisive answer, to Gershon Sholem, who accused her that she lacked Avat Israel, love of Israel. Her reply, I do not love the Jews, nor do I believe in them, is the motto in the pre of the present day uh, progressives. Unlike former apostates who turned their back on Judaism and Jewishness, uh, an important segment of contemporary kosherizers claim a superior connection, and I'm in defense of the superior connection to Jewish identity and history. These are not the traditional anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox community, which has always rejected Zionism as false messianism. The current kosherizers are modern women and men who harken back to the iconic prophet Amos, who prophesized Israel's destruction because the cup of its sins has overflown. Speaking hard truth to powers, writes Brent Rosen, who is the co-chair of the Rabbinical Council of Jewish Voice for Peace, quote, is a venerable Jewish tradition that dates back to the prophets. They do not reject the Jewish identity, to, uh, uh, or they don't, sorry, they do not reject Jewish identity or Judaism. To the contrary, they argue that they have a superior claim to it and are demanding a place in the Jewish community. Inspired by Jewish tradition, this is how the most controversial and most important contemporary anti-Israel organization 
begins its mission statement. Jewish Voice for Peace has made it onto the ADL, the Under the Information League, uh, top 10 anti-Israeli organization. But it insists that it is a Jewish organization defined by the Jewish values of, quote, peace, justice, social justice, equality, human rights, respect for international law, and the U.S. foreign policy based on these ideals. JVP opposes discrimination against both Arabs or Jews. It condemns both the occupation and terrorism, though primarily it concerns itself with attacking the state of Israel. The struggle, according to its executive uh, uh, director, Rebecca uh, Wilkemerson, is not about the end of Israel. And by the way, I want to say that uh, I um, not only read Rebecca Wilkemerson's words, I actually met her and interviewed her. In addition to that, I also um, talked to Brand Rosen. He's a, you'll see him later, you know, he's the guy, he's the chief. And I'm sort of, you know, acquaintance with some people in JVP, so I had emails with them because um, I wanted to get it right. Um, uh, the struggle, according to uh, Dr. Merson, is not about the end of Israel, but a vision for justice that all of us can be proud of to say we've played a role in encouraging. This is not born out, born out of an examination of the organization's uh, statements and activities. JVP endorses all non-violent campaigns against Israel, including those that seek to destroy the Jewish self-determination. It may envision a country named Israel existing, but that country would have very little in common with the political and ideological entity that Israel currently occupies. It features imagined Judaism and Jewish values. As Bill Kimmerson admits, we talk about Jewish values, but we say that these are our Jewish values, informed by cultural radicalism and postmodern sensibilities about power, colonialism, and nationalism. JVP activists imagine a multi-ethnic, multicultural utopia replacing the racist colonial state of Israel. They invent an anesthetized, beautified Judaism, a psychological, intellectual state of mind that is divorced from the Jewish collective and from the experience of Jews as individuals and as a people through history. It's a messianic, millennial vision. The good Jew is not the strong Israeli defending his home, but the stateless, cosmopolitan, alienated Jew, humanity's canary in the coal mine, the one who had not been debased by the trappings of power and particularist solidarities, the ally of the weak and unfortunate, whoever and wherever they are. A cast of who's who uh, of the Jewish radical, of Jewish radical academia serve on JVP Advisory Council. Philosopher, philosopher Noam Chomsky and Judith Butler, filmmaker Woody Aloni, playwrights Tony Kochter and Eve Ensler, political critic Naomi Klein, historians Avi Schlein, Talmudic scholar, of course, Daniel Boyarin and more. Butler has replaced Chomsky as the head of the, anti -Jew, of the Jewish anti-Israel coalition. The feminist and gay activist and arguably the most celebrated figure in American Academy these days, Butler is performing the role of the American Foucault. Transgressive, openly gay, obtuse and obfuscating rhetoric, and always swinging to the left of the cultural left. Butler's venture into the Jewish fray came rather late in her life, in the 1980s and became most prominent in the aftermath of September 11 and the second Intifada. She is the most visible supporter of the Boycott Israel campaign, going as far as objecting to having the papers of Franz Kafka housed in Jerusalem for fear that people who want to study Kafka will have to fill a form in the Israeli National Library and by that confirm that the State of Israel exists. Butler's involvement in anti-Israel campaign is endowed a movement with the radical chic. A self-identified Jew uh, she had her son bar mitzvah, and that's how she is describing herself. And I'm not going to read it to you because I assume some of you can read. If, uh, uh, in, but you know, she said she grew up in Cleveland. She went to talks with her rabbi in Cleveland. You know, she said you know she was she misbehaved in, 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 in Sunday school, uh, and so she was sent away. And, and so she was had this private talk with the rabbi, and she claims this is what formed her ethics, her sort of tutorials with uh, with her rabbi. Um, and it was their education that led her to the, uh, quote, ethical and political resistance to Zionism. Now, most, most people, most Jews have turned Butler off long ago. But her celebrity makes her automatically the most important Jewish kosherizer of modern anti-Semitism. She has become a, light, a lightning rod to both defenders and enemies of Israel. Her involvement in the BDS conference in Brooklyn College in 2013 catapulted the gathering into a front page news. Butler epitomizes the Gentile's Jew, the credit to the race. A persona non grata in most Jewish circles, 
she is toasted the great court Jew of the intellectual establishment, the humanist philosopher who represents what good Judaism could become in the 21st century if we could all be like Butler, hence the Adorner Prize. JVP believes that an international boycott of Israel products and institutions can force Israel to change course. It supports movements and organizations of divestment campaigns all over the world. Wilkemerson denies that BDS campaigns are anti-Semitic. And on the face of it, she's absolutely correct. Boycotts are a legitimate political tactic employed through history by many groups with different agendas. The BDS movement, however, aims at not that, but at undoing 1948. Its leader, Omar Barghouti, decisively declared that the racist apartheid state of Israel has no right to exist. And Cal State Stanislaus science professor, political science professor, um, Assad Abu Khalil, put it even blander, quote, the real aim of BDS is to bring down the state of Israel. That should be stated as an unambiguous goal. There should not be any equivocation on the subject. Justice and freedom for the Palestinians are incompatible with the existence of the state of Israel. All too often, JVP activists find themselves uh, in coalition. Um, let me see if I got the. In coalition with Holocaust deniers, Islamists, all out anti Semites who actually believe in the protocols of the Elders of Zion, and with the advocates of the elimination of Israel. Butler has voiced support for Hamas and Hezbollah, two openly anti Semitic organizations who declared in their, their desire to eliminate Israel, but also to kill Jews um, all over the world. Because, as she put it, quote, their fight against imperialism makes them members of the global left. So they're good. But members of JVP are neither useful idiots nor anti-Semitic. Though their profound anti-Semitic with the Palestinian struggle against Israel often puts them in the company of unsavory characters and organizations. They are moved by the real plight of the Palestinians living under Israeli occupation, though they construct a simplistic binary narrative of a struggle between evil colonists and virtuous native victims. They stand against the identification of Judaism and collective Jewish identity with Israel. Zionism, as Avi Shleim declared, is the real enemy of the Jews. Sorry, that should have been the... So, whatever. I'll put the next slide somewhere in the middle. So you <laughs> this is to be the unsavory alliances. I have no idea why. I, um, JVP has grassroots appeal among the young and disaffected American Jewish community, in the American Jewish community. It is an exclusively Jewish organization, from staff to membership, and it's growing. In a very short time, it amassed some 140,000 supporters and over 4,000 due-paying members. Now, I, I want to point out to you that due-paying is, uh, is a big deal. Um, and it's launched uh, nearly 40 chapters in leading universities all over the United States. There's talk of JVP Hebrew School, JVP Summer Camp, and more. Growing number of young, educated Americans are attracted to its view of multicultural Judaism. It eschews tribalism for universal human solidarity. Whereas mainstream Judaism rejects intermarriage, JVP Universalism promises an equal place in the community for those marrying into the faith and not convert. An important consideration in the United States where over 70% of non-Orthodox Jews uh, marry outside uh, the faith. The young are attracted to the New Age spirituality and celebration of authentic religious sentiments over the synagogue's stodgy insistence of observance and ritual. Israel is in contrast. It seems to stand for the opposite. Its official pro-Jewish laws and practices, orthodoxy's monopoly over religion, and its claim to speak for all Jews wherever they are. And obviously the occupation has provided ample examples of abuse, discrimination, and oppression. It is no coincidence that many university Hillels are struggling to define their relationship to JVP. The national organization instructions that local Hillel's chapters do not uh, sponsor speakers and events who call for the destruction of Israel has brought the Swarthmore, Wesleyan, and Vassar chapters to break with the organization and declare themselves an open Hillel's. 
And while other chapters have been have not officially gone rogue yet, and I'm saying yet because I expect that most university levels will ultimately um, break the, uh, the the attempt to, to uh, uh, control this course. Um, JVP student groups are making inroads into Hillel leadership councils all over. In its culture and practices, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, is in tune with the emerging anti-institutional mood that is shaking the foundations of the conservative and reform movements in America. As the recent Pew Research starkly reminds us, the youngs are opting out. Many of those who choose to stay and remain Jewish do so as individuals without particular affiliation. Or if they want to join a community, they join independent minyanim, divorced from the broader Jewish community. The young women and men who join JVP, according to Wilke Merson, embody this attitude. Coming from observant homes, these activists have a connection to Jewish practices and spirituality that is independent of the traditional congregational Sunday school emphasis on Israel and the Holocaust. Whereas other older activists underwent a disillusionment process that shook the foundation of the connection to Judaism, younger, younger Jewishly literate activists are perfectly comfortable with Judaism without Israel. JVP activists tend to find a home in Reconstructionist synagogues. The JVP Rabbinical Council is led by two Reconstructionist pulpit rabbis, Brant Rosen, um, here, this is him, um, an absolutely lovely guy, if you ever want one, I, um, he's married, otherwise I would leave my wife for him. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, it by Brant Rosen. Uh, he is the Reconstruction Congregational uh, 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 Rabbi of uh, Evanston, Illinois, and Margaret Holub of the Mendocino Coastal Jewish Community in California. Um, she is a slightly different figure. She's more like New Age, you know, healing, drumming, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but you know, Rosen is a very serious uh, 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 person. Um, but. Uh, so, and, and most of the rabbis in the JPP Regional Council